that quality before that water flows into a service reservoir and then to the distribution system which brings it out of the tap in your home. There is a lot of legislation that covers the quality of water suitable for human consumption. It is an EEC directive which requires water authorities or water undertakers to monitor for up to 60 or 70 determinants routinely in that drinking water. And probably the most important in these are the, are the metal levels, toxic metals, things like cadmium, lead, mercury, zinc, copper. And then uh, there are pesticides, herbicides used in agriculture. And these are routinely monitored uh, back at the laboratory. Well, without uh, trying to be too biased about it, I think the scientist has a very important role to play. Because at the end of the day, what is important is the public health aspect of drinking water. Terry is a water sampler. He takes samples from reservoir outflows and the entire supply system. We take water so much for granted. We go to the tap and we turn it and we drink it. And it's only when we go abroad on holidays that we realize how safe our drinking water supply is back home. And it's only safe because it's monitored almost around the clock, 365 days a year, by some very dedicated people who feel that that is a very important job to be done. The result must be unambiguous. We can't say, we think it's about so-and-so. Uh, there are criteria that lay down the maximum allowable concentration of a substance in a drinking water. And it's no good as saying, well, it's double or half that concentration. It is important that we are precise and that we can be specific about the result that we produce. All water authorities need up-to-date laboratories where all the samples are taken for chemical analysis. That is, finding out just what the water contains. Regular sampling and analysis is the only way to make sure the water in our taps is pure and fit to drink. Hello, Audrey. Hello, Terry. Okay. In this laboratory, the work is organized by computer. The first job is to log in the samples. The computer is programmed to know which tests need to be done on which samples. The smooth running of the laboratory is the responsibility of chief chemist, Tony Poole. 90% of our work, which, which we're set up to do, is routine checking of water. And that includes drinking water for its quality, for public consumption, rivers and streams, the quality of those, whether they're getting more polluted, less polluted with, with time, uh, looking at industrial discharges and sewage discharges into rivers and estuaries and into the sea, all of which have standards they must meet. One of the measurements, the amount of oxygen in the water, is still done in the old-fashioned way using bottles and tubes and coloured indicators. Great skill is required to judge exactly when the colour changes. And to read off the results accurately. But in the water industry today, chemical analysis done in this old-fashioned way is dying out. In a modern laboratory, with so much work to do, more and more of the tests are done automatically by machine. Machines have lots of advantages. If somebody comes in with an emergency sample, for example for ammonia, we can analyse it and they can have the results while they're waiting about five minutes. This machine is controlled by a computer. It's running most of the day. Uh, analyzing uh, all different types of samples. Well, we measure ammonia, chloride, phosphate, nitrate, uh, hardness. It can analyze 90 samples in about 10 minutes. It consists of a sample wheel and a reagent wheel where the tests take place. There's a sampler which transfers the samples from the sample wheel to the test wheel where the reagents are added and the mixture from the reagent tubes is transferred into a colorimetric cell where the color is measured and the measurement takes place. Everything on this automatic machine is organized so that the routine work can be looked after by the machine's own computer. 
To analyse for a particular substance, the sample is automatically sucked up and transferred to a reaction tube. The correct chemical or chemicals are then added and a reaction takes place. Then an indicator is added. The indicator will change colour if a reaction has taken place and the amount of colour change will show the extent of reaction. The colour change is measured by shining a light into the reaction tube and seeing how much light passes through. The computer can then work out the amount of substance being tested. The instrument can measure very small quantities. Well, basically it measures two types of samples, dirty samples and clean samples. In the case of ammonia, it measures a high range, uh, 0 to 100 ppm, uh, for dirty water and low range 0 to 2 ppm for clean water. PPM, that's one part per million. That's like adding one teaspoonful of the substance to a whole swimming pool, mixing it up and yet still being able to detect the original substance. Why is this work so important? Well, of course, there's a big argument over this. Those people in the lab think that the most important thing is producing the result. But the scientist in the field needs the result to actually undertake a whole range of, uh, of applications. Probably the most important aspect of the work is the quality of the water in people's houses. A lot of time taking regular samples from different houses, as well as emergency samples when there's been a complaint. Good morning. Wessex Water Authority, you have a problem with your water? Yes. Come this way. The kitchen's just through there. Thanks. The quality of the water is the responsibility of Dave Palmer. We take samples from the water, from the raw water, as it goes through the treatment plant, through the distribution system, and at all stages, and the final stage is as it comes out of the consumer's tap. So a high percentage of our samples are taken from the consumer's own houses. Uh, in addition, of course, to the complaint samples, we go around and sample when consumer complains and equally have that analysed as well. Well, the consumers complain mostly about things which they can either see or they can taste. So one of the main complaints is of dirty water, if we've been changing the water supply around and it, it stirred up some sediment in the mains, or something they can taste. Most consumers dislike the taste of chlorine, so they might complain that the water tastes chlorinous or... Um, that the, the water tastes flat or earthy or something like that. It's Brian Wibberley's job to find out what is causing the problems. Even water which is pure enough to drink contains a number of substances. These need to be first separated from each other and then identified. This machine is the authority's gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Basically a solution of the compounds of interest is, in is injected into the gas chromatograph. The gas chromatograph separates the different compounds and then the mass spectrometer analyzes those compounds. The whole machine is, is controlled by a computer and there is a library stored on disk. Inside the gas chromatograph is a tube containing a thick oil or a porous solid with a stream of gas flowing through it. The mixture of unknown substances is squirted into one end of the tube. The different substances are carried by the gas at different speeds. So the substances come out of the other end of the tube one at a time. In the mass spectrometer, the beam of substances passes through the poles of a very strong magnet, and so the beam is bent. In fact, the substance breaks up inside the mass spectrometer, producing lots of bits. Each bit is bent a different amount, and the amount of bend can be measured by moving a detector to the end of the beams. The result is a pattern on a screen, a sort of fingerprint for the substance. Every substance has its own unique fingerprint pattern. The computer identifies the pattern by comparing it with the patterns for known substances it already has stored in its memory. We use this machine for all sorts of different organic analysis, both for routine monitoring of things like pesticides, trace organics in drinking water, and examination of industrial effluents. We also look at all sorts of different pollution incidences, 
any organic compounds that are spilt on in or near a watercourse. We look at fish mortalities. Um, we look for causative agents of taste and odour problems in drinking waters. The other main problem for the Water Authority is wastewater, sewage. This is the incoming sewage for the city of Bath. Sue's job is to take samples from the wastewater system. Once again, daily samples are sent to the laboratory for analysis. Then there are more unusual problems. This firm makes printed circuit boards. There's a danger that copper metal might escape into the wastewater. Well, there are legal requirements and there are a number of Acts of Parliament which uh, control the discharges of trade effluent into the sewerage system. Principally the 1936 Public Health Act and latterly the 1974 Control of Pollution Act uh, enables a water authority to lay down conditions which will cover uh, proportion of metals, proportion of solids, proportion of solvents that can be discharged from a particular factory into the sewerage system. And of course we sample, and if we uh, find that a trader is violating a consent, then it can result in prosecution. All the industrial effluent ends up with the domestic waste in the sewage works, where much of the treatment is done by natural biological processes, by microbes. But the microbes can be damaged by certain metals. Central to the design of any sewage treatment works is the analytical data that the laboratory produces. There are 20 filters at this works, and a number of years ago we lost over half the filters because of a discharge of chromium from a plating industry. We had many thousands of parts per million of chromium in the incoming effluent and that resulted in all of the filter life being killed and it took about six months for it to re-establish. The levels of metals in water are measured by atomic absorption. First, the samples have to be made ready for the machine. Yes, the samples which uh, are to be analysed for trace metals are first prepared by acidification and warming them to bring, them to, into, bring the metals into solution in the water and then they're loaded into the carousel of the analyzer where they will be squirted into the machine in the form of... The metal ions in solution are converted into atoms in the flame which you see in the, inside the machine. Uh, through this flame is shone light of a special wavelength which is tuned in to one metal at a time. For instance, if we're doing copper, if we're measuring copper in water, we set the machine to the special wavelength for copper and we shine that light through the flame which the sample will find itself in. The machine itself monitors the light coming through the flame and can detect losses in that light. The more copper we spray into the flame, the more light will be lost. And in this way, the machine can calculate the amount of copper present in the water. The machine can then calculate the quantity of copper that was in solution from this light measurement and print the results for us and store them on a computer. The results we produce are used by the Water Authority itself to estimate the quality of the water in the environment. The Water Authority is also responsible for the quality of the rivers in its area. All sorts of pollution can get into the rivers, pollution that can damage or even kill the fish and plant life. The Authority regularly monitors the rivers, but it also gets information from the public. Good morning, control room. Can I help you? You wish to report on oil pollution? Right. Can I have your name and address, please, sir? Right. This ultra-modern control room was built to monitor the various water systems over hundreds of square miles. The flow of pure and waste water into and out of the rivers can all be regulated from here if necessary. Right, fine. And where is the, the actual incident? In Malmesbury. Foxley Bridge. Right, OK, fine. Thank you very much. I'll uh, pass it on and get someone to attend. OK, bye-bye.
The Water Authority has to deal with a surprisingly large number of incidents, and some of them are far from routine, such as this crashed tanker full of beer. Well, I got here within about half an hour and uh, met up with the police officers that were dealing with the incident. Um, the tanker was lying just as you see it now, and it was leaking very slowly from a fracture in the pipework. Um, some of the uh, beer was, was soaking away in the ditch here, but uh, some had actually got through to the watercourse. So the first thing to do is really to ascertain um, whether any serious damage had been done to either the brook or the main River Avon itself. Well, whilst uh, beer, as we know, is quite wholesome for, for us to drink, it becomes a sort of a poison once it gets into the, the stream in that uh, it provides food for all the bacteria and the small microorganisms that live in the stream. Uh, their numbers increase and they, they basically eat it up. And all the time that this is happening, they're using oxygen at quite a, ra a rate uh, from the water itself. Uh, now, in a, in a severe situation, you might end up with a total depletion of oxygen. And then, of course, the fish and all other life in, in the brook would, would suffocate. What are the sort of signs to look for? Well, by basically observation, looking for signs of fish in distress, uh, and also by taking readings of the levels of dissolved oxygen in the water. And in fact, I found that they were fairly satisfactory and uh, there are no signs of any fish in distress. 97, control one, I read you. Control one from 97. Uh, could you relay to me the analytical results for the samples that I took earlier on, please, over? Uh, Bravo 97, control one. Yes, the results from upstream of the spillage. The BOD was 1.4. So then, of course, the main concern then was we've got a tanker with getting on for 4,000 gallons of beer inside. We needed to make sure that that wouldn't actually get through if, uh, say, the load shifted and uh, the tank actually ruptured. So we installed a couple of temporary dams across the ditch that it's lying in to cater for just that sort of eventuality. There was still the question of how much beer was left inside the tanker. I think we're going to be having chocolate. Put it in there. Yeah. But there was still a large amount in another compartment. No. Dave took Not the decision bad. to bring in a pump to get rid of the beer. Well, basically the idea is we, we pump it onto the land. Um, yes, it will eventually get back into the brook, but by the time that happens, the bacteria that live in the soil will have broken it all down and rendered it quite harmless. This is a fairly good solution as far as the Water Authority is concerned. Mind you, what the local cows are going to think about beer-flavoured grass, they're really not too sure. <laughs>